Hello and welcome to another episode of Better Business, Better Life. I'm your host, Deborah Chantry-Taylor, and today I am joined by the delightful Dr. Vanessa Ingraham, who is a colleague and friend. Um, she is an integrated physician, and I'm going to actually start by um, ask, asking her to explain what that means. So welcome to the show, Dr. V. Lovely to have you. Thank you. Thank you, Deb. So I guess um, so a lot of people are kind of familiar with this idea of kind of holistic medicine. It's the idea of combining the very best of evidence-based natural therapies with the judicious use of conventional therapies. So in the, in the world of kind of integrative medicine, we're not choosing sides. We're looking at the person, we're treating the root cause, and we're coming up with a strategy that encompasses the most appropriate treatments, and they could range from pharmaceutical um, intervention, surgery, but also using lifestyle interventions, maybe botanical medicine, supplements, um, in the biohacking world, things like nootropics and peptides, and just kind of combining a personalized strategy for people. Excellent. So how did you get into that? Because that's um, that's quite a different way of approaching uh, you know, the treatment of various diseases, but also just general life stuff. So what, what, drew, what drew you towards that? Well, I kind of feel like I had no other choice. My dad was, or my dad is a, was a, is a conventional or was a conventional medical doctor. Um, I grew up in the Bahamas and early on he kind of began to ask a lot of questions. He realized that the paradigm that he was educated under wasn't giving him the best results in terms of helping clients. He was really feeling like in terms of prevention and in terms of really helping people thrive. You know, just the the approach, the conventional approach of, you know, 15 minute visits, prescribing a drug wasn't really getting him to where he wanted to with his clients. And so, you know, back when I was a small child, um, I actually had a had a reaction to a very standard medical treatment. So it kind of led him down this path of inquiry about asking kind of what else is there. And so he became pretty much one of the first you could call integrative or holistic doctors in the Bahamas. And then my mom who was, you know, very entrepreneurial minded, but, you know, but was, was a housewife and was working with my dad, decided to become an entrepreneur. And she opened a chain of health food stores in the Bahamas. So I kind of grew up in this environment where, you know, I had my dad as the doctor and my mom as the, you know, the nutritionist uh, supplement guru. And so I feel like even though I initially wanted to be a veterinarian, I kind of had no other choice. <laughs> Yeah, actually a funny story. When I was, um, I was actually in um, a pre-veterinary program in the U.S. and 9-11 happened. And funny enough, it brings us back to New Zealand. I was about to go into my first sheep lab to have my first experience with sheep, uh, learning how to vaccinate and, and handle sheep. And then just as we're about to go into the, the, the training, um, the, the teacher's assistant runs in and says there's been a terrorist attack. Long story short, because of that, um, I lost my international student visa and wasn't able to get back into the program. So the universe had other plans. I ended up in a pre-medical program. And then because of my dad and the influence of my family, instead of going into a more strict um, kind of conventional medical training, I decided to go into a, a program that had an approach that was more based on holistic medicine and integrative uh, therapies. Oh, okay. So how long ago was that then? Uh, and now now I'm in New Zealand and I still haven't ever handled a sheep. So, <laughs> Fair enough. so, so when was that? When, when, when did you go into that or, or switch? It was back in 9-11. So that, yeah, that's a, a while ago. Um, yeah. So yeah. I, I graduated from, from medical school in 2010, after which mm -hmm. I just love learning. So I have this, this super passion for being a student, you know, if, if things were different, I probably would still be doing a PhD or something else. But um, at that point, I decided to do a fellowship in regenerative and anti-aging medicine, which was kind of the, the cutting edge kind of research in things like stem cells and things like bioidentical hormone replacement therapy. And that was through um, an organization called the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. So I did that for, after um, I graduated, did that for five years, and then ended up moving back to the Bahamas and working with my father, which was such an incredible experience. So I was oh, able wow. to kind of yeah. uh, work in his practice and that was, you know, amazing learning. That, is, that would be a lot of fun, I think, working with your dad. So what brought you to New Zealand? Why are you here? So that's a funny story too. So I was working with my dad, minding my own business, you know, taking care of my patients in the Bahamas. And then one day I had a, I heard, I heard someone with a funny accent in our waiting room. 
And it, I came outside and I thought, oh, this, this guy, maybe he's from England. This is a strange accent. Turned out he was a good friend of, um, of uh, Michael Mail, who is the founder of Cookie Time. And long story short, Cookie Time um, in, in New Zealand is a large company. And obviously, you know, they're producing a product that maybe isn't the healthiest for people. So at that point, Michael, the founder of the company, had been going through his own kind of midlife crisis and decided to start a new, like a new venture. And his venture is now Nutrient Rescue. And so Michael brought me to New Zealand to formulate the products um, for Nutrient Rescue. And long story short, I never left. I fell in love with New Zealand. Fantastic. So I'm still working with Nutrient Rescue. Yeah, yeah. And we can see that you're obviously based out by the ocean there, which is, I know you love being in the outdoors and you've got a lot of research to show how important it is we spend more time outdoors, right? Oh, absolutely. I'd love to talk about that because it's really our circadian biology, our light environment, our exposure to the elements and our ability to cope with the evolutionarily appropriate physiological stress of a bit of cold, a bit of heat, a bit of UV light that really allows our, that really it really optimizes our ability to deal with psychological stress. And that's so important for our high performers and entrepreneurs that we work with. And we can talk more about that. Yeah, no, for sure. So you've been doing a lot of work uh, with entrepreneurs um, through Entrepreneurs Organization and other organizations. What attracted you to working with entrepreneurs? Well, it was basically just witnessing those that I love most in the world um, succumb to burnout. You know, people with big passions and big goals you know, compromise their health and, you know, just work too hard and end up in the situation where their mental health is suffering. Their physical health is, has declined to the point where they, they don't have that impact anymore. They don't, they're not great leaders. They're not, you know, they're not effective at work. You know, they have brain fog. They're not sleeping well. And so that really, you know, seeing that with my parents and seeing that with my ex-partner, it really drew me to kind of consider how I can make the most difference. And while I have big goals and big dreams myself, I've found that supporting the biology of those who are also there to change the world has been a, a really a great way to, you know, impact, impact everyone and make every make the world a better place. That's fantastic. So, what is that? So, the burnout is obviously a big thing within entrepreneurs. But um, you mentioned brain fog. Absolutely. And it's something that really fascinates me because I actually mm. thought for a long, long time that brain fog was just normal. It was just you know what happened. But it, you know now now that I've learned a lot more about it through you, and I'm I'm getting good sleep, and I'm looking after myself, and getting out in the fresh air first thing in the morning, and trying to work those circadian rhythms. You know, yeah. it's changed dramatically how the brain actually functions. So, what is brain fog? What causes it? And what can we do about it? So when we talk about brain fog, there's different physiological causes of brain fog, but the ultimate experience tends to be the same. It's the feeling like, you know, our brain isn't firing as quickly. We're maybe not, not able to access words as, as before. We're not as eloquent, or well-spoken. You know, we're forgetting things. We're, you know, we're maybe a bit more snappy. You know, sometimes it affects our emotions when our brain energy is low. We tend to not be as tolerant of other people and stress in our life. So that's kind of the, the sort of symptom picture. And it can also manifest often as brain fog is kind of on the spectrum with um, low mood. So it can be, you know, uh, not being able to be as sharp, but then also just feeling a bit depressed or lacking motivation or, you know, whereas before you jump out of bed and, you know, be excited about work, just that feeling of, oh, just another day. <laughs> so that's kind of the spectrum and the experience. And when it comes to the causes of brain fog, obviously there's individuality between different people, but the main causes or the main physiological cause often has to do with something called neuroinflammation. So that's a mild level of inflammation that affects the brain. And when our brain is just irritated or a little bit inflamed, that impacts our ability to make neurotransmitters. It, it, it impacts our brain's ability to make energy. And it's the brain's energy or you know, mitochondrial energy production that allows our neurons to fire quickly and us to be kind of sharp and on point. And then if we go a level deeper, the causes of that kind of broad neuroinflammation can be anything from hormone imbalances stress and cortisol is a big one so when we're under long-term stress that cortisol tends to be very irritating to the brain it can also stem from things like um, gut inflammation or immune system imbalances that's why we also see kind of brain fog with things like long covid um, post-viral illness things like that 
can also be due to kind of sex hormone issues, like as, um, as testosterone drops in men, especially when there's a lot of stress that'll tend to affect men's testosterone. Or women, if they've had a lot of stress going through menopause, when the ovaries stop working as well, and the adrenal glands, which make cortisol, are now asked to kind of make sex hormones, but they're quite depleted because of long-term stress, that can also impact the brain's kind of immune system and this idea of neuroinflammation. Of course, then we have, you know, the obvious ones like lack of sleep. During sleep, it's so interesting. Just like we have our lymphatic system in our body that helps, it's almost like the, the garbage system. It kind of cleans things out and kind of moves um, toxic metabolites and, and um, kind of gunk out to kind of clear our, our immune system out. Our brain has something called the glymphatic system. And this is this part of the, the brain's kind of cleansing ability is present only when we have deep sleep. So if we're not going into deep sleep, our brain doesn't get that nocturnal kind of cleansing and um, protein buildup can affect inflammation, um, different exposures to environmental chemicals, things like that don't get cleaned out and that can lead to a low level of um, brain fog. And then of course, the last one is our lifestyle factors. So things like if, again, our circadian rhythm is off, if we're not getting enough bright light during the day and it's too bright at night, we're not going to sleep as well. Our brain's not going to cleanse as well and we're going to be left with brain fog. And then, of course, mm. the other obvious one is nutritional deficiencies and, you know, recreational activities. So things like <laughs> alcohol before bed, you know, too much stress will deplete certain vitamins, a poor diet, um, all of these things. It's really, it's, it's quite individualized, but the the kind of the symptom picture is similar. Mm. So really, I mean, a lot of us will actually have multiple factors that are actually affecting it and it's trying to get to what the root cause really is and understanding what is um, driving those various levels and what, what could be having an effect on the brain. Is that what you're saying? Absolutely. And it's, it's about discovering the root causes and then almost like an onion peeling back and being very strategic about where to start. So, you know, someone may have a little bit too much alcohol, high stress hormones, low sex hormones, and lack of sleep. Like, where do you start? And really being mm. systematic about starting with the foundation. And then often the other the things that are kind of built upon that foundation will prove on their own. So it's about understanding, you know, the basics and then creating kind of a strategy to address the individual causes. Yeah. Yeah. We're very fortunate aren't we, these days. We've got a lot more tools at our disposal to kind of monitor what's going on. So, you know, I'm a big fan of my aura or aura ring, whatever you call it. And um, there are there are lots of different things out there that can actually help glucose monitors, things that are not, mm -hmm. uh, that probably weren't readily available to the average person in the past. What do you, what do you recommend? Do you have any sort of favorite little tools that you go, this, this can be a real helpful tool to understand what's going on? Um, in terms of brain fog, I think you nailed it. So looking at sleep first is so pivotal and so fundamental. Mm. So anything you can do to monitor sleep would be great. Like I love the aura ring. Um, I like the aura ring. I'll just say it right away and no affiliation. Much better than things like Apple Watches. Because the aura ring, they actually use the color of the laser they use to monitor, to do their monitoring. is actually a red laser. And we talk about circadian rhythm and the fact that blue light at night can disrupt our sleep. If we have an Apple Watch that's continuously blinking blue or green light into our wrist, potentially that could even impact sleep. So love the aura ring, especially if you put on airplane mode at night, you can get so yeah. much information. But one thing I want to just mention about trackers. So the sleep trackers on the wearable devices, kind of this, this generation where we are now, they're not 100% accurate. At best, they're probably about 70 to 80% um, accurate in terms of their monitoring. But the biggest, the biggest benefit of them or the most important use is tracking your data over time. So we're looking at trends. So I want to tell people, don't get too hyper-focused on what it says per night. You want to see how you're doing over time. And as long as you see that, you know, that readiness score and that um, sleep score go up, that's, that's yeah. great. But don't get too hyper-focused on all this one night because there's a lot of things that can affect the accuracy um, day to day. And that's probably true for most measurable devices. Like we say, don't jump on the scales Absolutely. every day either. You know, you actually look, you are, I mean, no, exactly. I'm actually, I'm thinking about this as a little bit like EOS, you know, we're looking for, sure, we look at the numbers, but we're actually looking for trends to go, where is something going right or where is something going wrong? So we can do more of the things that are going right and less of the things that are going wrong. So it's very similar to running a business really, isn't it? Our, our body is Absolutely. our business. <laughs> yeah. Absolutely. And you should take it that seriously. You know, when I, when I, you know, talk to entrepreneurs and CEOs, 
you know, just, just having that realization that your body business or the business of your health is going to be fundamental to the success of your overall business. So, you know, address that one first, <laughs> mm-hmm. be the best CEO of your body as you can be. <laughs> I'm just, you've just talking about sleep. You've kind of reminded me of something I'm, I'm curious, but I'm not sure if you have the answer or not, but you know, there's this whole thing that there are people who are morning people and there are people who are evening people. Is that a real mm-hmm. thing or is that something that we've learned over time? Well, how, how do you feel about that? Yeah, so there is slight um, genetic kind of variation in, so we have, so go back it up. So we have our, our circadian rhythm is, is under genetic control. So even if we were, say, placed in a completely dark cell for four or five days, we would still maintain a circadian rhythm. So there is some genetic, there's a genetic component to that. And there is slight variation between if people will prefer to be more active a little bit earlier or a little bit later. But what I'll say is in the modern world, most of this idea of morning and night people is driven by our light environment. So, you know, I I would challenge anyone who says they're a a night owl to go camping for a week, you know, have no devices and no light and then see. And maybe after, if you still find you're up all night under the stars, then maybe you are a night person. But I think generally this, you know, it's it's a bit of a, a, I don't want to say gimmick, but it's, um, I don't think it's, it's quite, it's definitely not under the... It's, it's not as biologically um, maybe influenced as some, as, as some uh, I guess, th- people yeah. or, or podcasts or whatever will make it, make it seem. <laughs> and it's interesting, is it? So we were talking about this the other day um, around the whole, yes, there's the blue light thing, but it's also about where the light is in the sky, right? So a lot of us Absolutely. have got, particularly in modern homes, we've got all these down lights mm. that are on all the time. And that actually mimics the uh, the sun being um, in the middle of the day, because that's where the sun is in the middle of the day, isn't it? It's right up high. So it isn't just about the the blue light, but it's really about light in general. Is that right? Absolutely. So the, the, the cells in our eyes that sense blue light that are most sensitive are actually at the bottom, kind of the, the bottom of our eyes. So light coming in from the top is going to be much more stimulating than that same intensity of light coming from the ground because we don't have quite the same amount of cells that are receptors at the top of the eyeball. So just like you said, you know, obviously limit your light at night, but if you, you know, if you are going to have some lights, having a lamp that's at eye level or down lights are much, much more important. Um, much more biologically appropriate and will interfere with sleep a lot less. Mm. I mean, the interesting thing about light, though, especially natural light, is it's not ubiquitous. So throughout the day, natural light is continuously changing in terms of the the proportion of um, UV light, the proportion of infrared light. And we've we've evolutionarily adapted to be very sensitive to those changes. So first thing in the morning, when the sun is below 10 degrees, kind of, kind of coming up over the horizon, the... The, inf- the uh, UV light, which is kind of short wavelength, high powered light, it can't really penetrate the atmosphere. So we have a lot of red light. So that's so in the morning, that's why sometimes the sunrise looks a bit pink. That UV or that infrared light that's present in the morning starts to set our circadian rhythm and programs our brain to secrete different hormones first thing in the morning. Then when the sun rises and it's at a higher angle and you get more of that UV light and the blue colored light. So the light throughout the day actually is very mm-hmm. different and gives our body very different information in terms of how it kind of programs us. So it's really important to, if you're working inside all day, you know, like people used to take smoke breaks, take sun breaks where you go outside and your eyes, you know, without glasses can experience the changing spectrum and intensity of light throughout the day. And that's yeah. going to help with hormone balance, especially, um, and ob- obviously with sleep. Yeah. And it's interesting because, you know, I run um, client sessions here for full days. And um, in the summertime, Mm. we're actually able to sit outside on the balcony because it's beautiful out there. It's nice Mm. to get some sunshine. And I have to say, it makes a difference to the energy in the room for the afternoon as well. Getting out just for that half an hour to an hour out in the sunshine in the middle of the day rather than sitting inside. um, It's phenomenal how that changes the whole, um, yeah, the whole energy and mood in the room in the afternoon. Absolutely. So it's not just blocking light at night, but it's also, I think we have a deficiency of bright light during the day. So when you're in, even if you're in the con- a conference room in a stadium with the brightest indoor lights, that's not going to be anywhere near as bright as outside on even the cloudiest day. So in terms of intensity, the light matters for our energy levels and also for our neurotransmitter levels. So things like dopamine and serotonin need a, 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 a very high intensity of light to really be optimized. 
So even if we're inside, we think it's very bright, it's not going to be anywhere near as bright as the light outside. So that is probably yeah, why you did experience that. Yeah, and I hadn't thought about that in terms of, yeah, even when it's cloudy, it's still bright, right? It's not as if... Um, it's a lot um, brighter. Yeah. It's very, very different to night. Okay, so sleep is, is obviously one of the most important things. Tell, and, so, and then getting the right amount of light. We're not only um, at the right mm. time, but just actually being exposed to that so you can, um, mm. I was going to say grow the chemicals. That's not what I meant, but produce the chemicals that are required to kind of keep you all in, in sync. What other things should you pay attention to? I think the other the other things to pay attention to another big thing I see is is this is our breathing. So breathing just like our light environment is fundamental to health. And a lot of people when they're under stress, they tend to breathe mouth breathe. So and also because of you know being inside too long, we tend to be a little bit more stuffy if we're not moving a lot, our sinuses tend to be more congested and people will start mouth breathing. And when we mouth breathe, and especially if we do this overnight, our brains don't get sufficient oxygen. So our energy levels just go through the, you know, go through the big ground. And so I think just focusing on as much as possible, even when you're exercising, taking deep breaths through, through your nose is key. And also just, you know, standing up and getting movement throughout the day. Like that's why I love the aura ring, you know, and the activity, it says uh, inactivity. And I try to keep that down, even if it means, you know, standing up for five or 10 minutes every hour or two. Yeah. I, think that's I, I have one. to say the whole the whole breathing, the whole nose breathing, mouth, nose and mouth breathing thing. Again, we talked about this several weeks mm -hmm. ago now, and and you recommend it because I've always been a mouth breather in the evening, um, and I knew that I was, mm. but I didn't realize what kind of impact it had. And I've just been using a teensy little bit of tape just to actually hold mm. the mouth together. And it's funny you don't need much because the mouth it's just enough to almost you know remind your brain that you don't need to open your mouth. And um, my sinuses have improved out of sight. Uh, and I, I, it's really odd because I would go to bed at night in the past and I would actually feel really clogged up and I feel like I couldn't breathe through my nose. And now that I'm actually breathing through my nose every single night by just putting that little bit of tape on my mouth, um, my sinuses are on a different level and breathing through my nose is actually really easy now. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's, it's yeah. so important too. If we think about just how we're supposed to breathe, so the air, you know, the air outside tends to be quite dry and it's full of allergens and mold and bacteria and viruses. When we breathe through our mouth, we're getting a lot of dry air. It's going straight into our throat and we're inhaling things into our lungs that should have been filtered out um, through our nose. When we breathe through our nose, we humidify the air as well. And we also get, again, much better oxygenation to the brain. When we breathe through our nose, it also just talks to our, or it talks to our nervous system. So nose breathing kind of puts us in a, a more calm state. Because if you think about it, evolutionarily, when we breathe through our mouth, <laughs> even if it's a little bit, it's something stressful is happening. <laughs> so yep. it's so important no, for even heart rate, for deep sleep, for um, insulin and, and cortisol levels, just nose breathing, especially at night. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And okay. also interesting, yeah, too, I'd when you love breathe. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I love this. Go stuff. ahead. When you breathe yeah. through your nose, you also produce more nitric oxide. So nitric oxide is the, it's a neurotransmitter, but it, ha, it allows vasodilation. So it allows the opening up of, of blood flow and the opening up of, of your nasal passages. So breathing through your nose has a big correlation to your cardiovascular health as well, just because you're whoop, producing more nitric oxide. And also the more you breathe through your nose, the more nitric oxide you'll produce and the more open your sinuses will be. So it's a win-win, simple trick. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> So the other thing that we will see, we see a lot of, particularly with social media, there's, there's all these adverts for supplements. You know, take this supplement and it will do this, mm -hmm. and take this supplement and it will do this. And, you know, we're almost led to believe that, you know, popping pills will um, will negate all the negative things that we're doing in life, which I'm suspecting isn't really true. What's your view on um, supplements in general? Well, I mean, I'll say directly, a lot of my life has been funded by supplements. Like I said, my mom owned supplement stores, so that, you know, helped put me through school. So I come, mm -hmm. you know, I've, I've been around supplements. I've been in the supplement industry my whole life. And while there are, there are, you know, many appropriate supplements, the first thing I'd say is until you've kind of optimized your, the basics, your breathing, your circadian rhythm, you're eating a, a whole food diet then you really have no business, you know, spending money on supplements because they really are, they really should be the icing on the cake, not the foundation to help treat or optimize health. 
And I mean, honestly, too, there's there's a lot of crap. Out, I mean, there's a lot of stuff out there that's either like in terms of, you know, there is good manufacturing process for and supplement companies, but there's a huge range of, of brands and ethical um, ethics in terms of um, production. So just like and people like to rip on big pharma, there's also a lot of um, misinformation and a lot of poor manufacturing process and mislabeling um, that goes on with the supplement industry. So reputable brands are important and also yeah. um, appropriate doses and timing of doses. So taking the same supplement at a different time of day will have a different result and the same supplement for a different person will, will act very differently. So it's, it's again personalized, but nail the foundations yep. first and then consider it. Fair enough. What about the nootropics and the, the, the drinks? You know, I, I've, I've got to admit, I mean, I do take mm -hmm. um, the mushroom every morning, I can't remember what it's called, now, the lion's mane yeah. every morning um, in my mm -hmm. juice that I now make with my new juicing machine. But um, the, the, the things like the Arepa drinks that you now see, the things that will say that they will actually boost your brain energy, do you, do the, is there some science behind that or is it a bit of a marketing ploy? Well, I mean, the, again, there's a huge range. So the, the term nootropic basically means something that's going to increase cognitive function without being harmful to health. And, you know, these range from natural things like, you know, Arepa, the black currants, all the way to, you know, off-label pharmaceuticals. And I guess, like, it just really depends on the compound. I will put a plug in for black currant because for nutrient rescue, obviously, we used um, a black currant cultivar called Benhar or Benhar. And it's actually been quite well studied for its ability to increase dopamine. So it's been used for people with mild Parkinson's and it's actually been clinically tested to help people's reaction time. So there is something to certain compounds, definitely. But again, it just, mm. you know, it depends on the compound. And if you want to ask specific ones, I'd love to discuss them, but it's hard to as a class. But again, you know, unless you've optimized everything else, then, you know, that's not going to help you. Mm. Okay, so there's so many things we could talk about, isn't it? But I think it, what we're really hearing is that Exciting. it does come down to getting the basics right and then uh, working on things individually to understand what's really going on in your body because just like, again, using the business analogy, um, all businesses are a little bit different. You can use frameworks, you can use tools to actually help them to get the best out of it, but it's never going to be cookie cutter because there are differences within the business itself. And I'm guessing that's the same for the body, right? Absolutely. And again, just understanding the root cause. So in your business, understanding why you're losing money instead of just putting more money into marketing, you know, understanding yep. why you're losing energy, you know, understanding why your brain's not working before throwing money at supplements. Is key. So where do you, when you're working with a client, and I know you love helping the entrepreneurs because of the, the massive impact they have, so therefore you're affecting more people. But if you're working with an entrepreneur, what, how do you first start? What is the first thing that you, you do with a new client? Yeah, so the first thing we do is basically a health discovery. So that's where we'll meet for you know 60 to 90 minutes and really get a good sense of, or I'll get a good sense of who they are, what their goals are, and tease out you know what's going on in their lifestyle, what their major stressors are. And then usually we'll do some either some functional or some conventional testing just to get some idea about biochemical individuality. So it's, I guess, the first process, almost like with a business, you know, considering a decision, you want to do your discovery and your, your investigation and get as much information you can before you kind of proceed with a, with a strategy. So that's kind of where we start. Perfect. And then from there, I mean, as the name integrative physician suggests, you're looking at mm -hmm. all the different options that can potentially be used um, to treat the, the root cause of those symptoms. So that's a mixture of devices, a mixture of um, natural supplements and potentially um, medicinal drugs if required as well, right? Absolutely. And also, you know, being able to give people a realization so they can better understand their body. I'm really big on education because I feel like when people understand why they're doing something, they're going to be much more um, prone to pushing through and keep doing it. So, you know, something like, you know, the benefits of cold therapy or having a cold plunge or a cold shower you know, it, it kind of sucks. So unless you really understand how it's going to affect your productivity and really kind of feel the buzz of the, you know, two to three hours of increased dopamine, then, you know, it's going to be easy to not do it. So I'm really big on education, but providing simple strategies. So I do all the research and then I distill it down 
and then I kind of deliver it to my client. Um, and, and obviously there has to be an agreement. You know, I, I present things and then they say yes, no, yes, no. And then we'll kind of, you know, find a way to track a goal and kind of monitor mm -hmm. that over time. Beautiful. Yeah. I mean, having worked with you, I understand exactly how you work and it's great because um, they, I, are I, you, are I know you having your cold showers. <laughs> Oh, I haven't had a cold shower yet. No, no, I still got to work on that. But, <laughs> <laughs> but I think, but, but what I was saying is, I think that it is really important. It's, it's like, um, it's even when we were, when we work as teams in the business sense, you know, we, we could give them answers. It's, it's very easy to kind of say, oh, you mm. should do this or you ought to do that or that. But actually, the, the best thing you can do is to work with them to get them to come to the right realization themselves and have an understanding of the impact. And, you know, we encourage businesses to try certain things and see what happens and, and observe, you know, the very first session we do with a client we get them to set some rocks for the first quarter and I almost know mm. that within that first quarter it'll probably go pretty wrong but it's really about them then learning from that and applying those learnings going forward which is what what's really important that way they're they're involved on that journey they understand what's going on because it'd be very easy for Absolutely. you to just kind of say you must do this you must do that you must do that but actually having them involved in the process means they're buying into it so we're not coming up with the, the Absolutely. answers but we're helping them come up with the answers Exactly. We're saying, you know, this is the strategy I proposed. Try it out. Mm -hmm. If you see results, keep going. If not, we can modify it. Perfect. Okay. So um, I always ask people to give some top tips and tools, but I want to actually do a little bit differently oh. with you. We talked about kind of, you know, the, the foundations, the things that you should really work on. So let's just recap on those and go, hey, what okay. are the things that um, people, you know, what are the foundations people need to get right in the first instance? Mm -hmm. So, so, what's the so first I would thing say, so very first thing I'd say for, you know, high performers, for, you know, even mums, anyone who is interested in optimal health, pay attention to your light environment. So the most important tip I can give you for productivity, for mood, for hormone balance is go outside in the morning. Even if it's 10 minutes, even if it means when you're driving in your car, you open your window, you really need to get oh, really? that morning light. Yeah, that morning light sets your energy level throughout the day. It sets your circadian rhythm to help you sleep that night. And it, you know, sets your immune system function and just overall health. So that morning light is incredibly important. So we really need that. So even just opening Second up one. your car window is, is worthwhile doing. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, better is to go outside. But I mean, you know, if, <laughs> yeah. if someone is, you know, they, they leave, you know, they, when they're leaving the house, it's dark and now they're driving to work and it's light. If you open the window, the cool thing about light is it's nonlinear. It doesn't have to be shining directly in the window. As long as you crack the window, the light will fill the car and you'll, you'll get, you'll get that, that stimulus through your eyes. So nice. that okay. would be the most, it's so simple. I mean, if you want to kind of one up that, get some movement in the morning. And especially if you can go for a walk or do something where you're, you're moving around under natural light in the morning, that's, that's also just a great way to set up your day, improve your sleep and support your hormone and stress levels. Mm -hmm. Yep, I must admit. Um, oh, here goes my dogs mm -hmm. now. Um, we the walk we do in the oh, morning is absolutely park. key to to setting up the day. And I think when I don't get to mm. do that walk, I feel terrible about it. So okay, so morning light even better. Next level up, get some walking in as well. Perfect. Definitely. Next thing, number two. <laughs> number two, I'd say, I'd say because we're all under a lot of psychological stress, or yeah, psychological stress. It's important for us, to, in order to cope with that better on a biological level, it helps to embrace some physiological stress. So that's where things like having a hot sauna, having a cold plunge, anything that's going to kind of stress your physiology for a short amount of time will actually improve your abil ability to deal with psychological stress. There's an incredible book, if you're interested in this, called The Comfort Crisis. Oh, I don't remember the author's name, but if you, if you look up The Comfort Crisis, You'll, mm -hmm. you'll kind of learn a lot about that. And it's, it's all about how we're much too comfortable. You know, we live in climate controlled homes. We're inside all day. We eat, you know, three or four meals a day. We're never a little bit hungry. And because okay. of this, we've become much more sensitive to the psychological stress. So a little bit of appropriate physiological stress, I think would be. And nice. even that's a hard okay. workout, you know, skipping a meal, cold shower, anything like that will actually help your psychological stress resilience. There you go. And it's written by a guy called Michael Easter. So that's, the Comfort that's a fantastic Crisis by book. Michael Easter. Yeah, yes. I'm going to have a look at that. Perfect. Yep. Okay. So get some morning light, hopefully get some movement, get some psycho, um, I was going to say psychological stress, but it's, it's physiological stress is what I was trying to say. Apologies. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 
I'm getting some now, getting a little bit too much sun. So that's a physiological <laughs> stress. We mustn't complain about that. We have not had good weather for a while, so it's nice to actually see the sun. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah, perfect. And what would be the last kind of thing that you would suggest can, can really make a difference to, to our busy, hectic, overwhelmed, crazy lives? <laughs> Oh, there's so many. I'm just going to stay with the really simple ones. I mean, the obvious mm. one kind of following in from the morning light is really being mindful about that light at night because it's mm. not just interfering with sleep when we have light at night. So if we look at our, our laptop and look at Facebook at 10 o'clock when our brain thinks it should be dark, it increases our cortisol, our stress hormone levels, but also our insulin. So a lot of people struggle with weight. They struggle with you know metabolic or cardiovascular disease. And a lot of this we don't realize is actually driven by light at night. There's a big study um, in China, of, I think it was uh, almost 500,000 women, showing that light at night was one of the biggest predictors of diabetes up independent of diet. So just having wow. light at night increased their blood sugar and you know, increased their risk of, of metabolic disease. So you know, at night, after the sun sets, using red lights, using blue blockers, using candles, if you have a fireplace, that's a, that's a better form of light. Using down lights, like you mentioned, would be so important. And um, yeah, just, just really being mindful of that few hours before bed of light. Mm -hmm. I mean, the other big one, too, is a connection between light and night and cancer. So there was oh, really? a big study called the Nurses Health Study that tracked women over 30 or 40 years and found that women that worked night shift had a much higher risk of breast cancer. And, you know, years later, as they investigated that, they actually found that it's because when we are exposed to light at night, we don't make melatonin. We've all heard about melatonin as a sleep hormone. Yeah, great. But it's not just a sleep hormone. It's a hormone that programs our immune system at night to go out and find rogue cancer cells and to clear them out and also to, to help protect us against virally infected cells. So it's an immune optimizing hormone as well as a sleep hormone. So light at night, you know, you have diabetes, all, you know, increase your risk of different chronic diseases, but cancer is a big one for light at night. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, the World That's... Health Organization has even classified shift work and circadian disruption as a probable human carcinogen. So this really? is a big one. It's not really a lot of people are talking about. Yeah. Oh, okay, that's huge. Okay, so I've got three really useful things there. So the light in the morning, get yourself up and moving, um, get, um, expose yourself so, to some controlled physiological stress, so hot saunas, cold showers, ice baths, all that kind of stuff, um, and then really watch that light at night and make sure that you're allowing your body to kind of you know properly wind down and, and do what it needs to do before you get to sleep. There is just one last question that this, this just raised for me. What about eating? Um, I, I, heard, I heard something mm. really interesting that three, two, one. So right. three hours before you go to bed, don't eat. Two hours, don't drink. No, was it one hour? One hour? I don't know. There was there was something there. What is it about eating at night? Why is why do we have to stop eating so soon before we get also in such a long time before we go to bed? So similar to how light controls our circadian rhythm, our movement and our food timing will will control our circadian rhythm. So if we eat late at night, that's a signal to the body that we should be awake. Then all of our energy and our, our reserve will go to our gut to help digestion, and we won't go into that deep restorative sleep. When we eat at night as well, you know, that's a time we should be fasting. Our blood sugar will be higher overnight, and that, again, predisposes us to having high insulin and um, you know, cardio, uh, metabolic disease. So that's great yeah. advice. I definitely agree with that. Mm. I have to have a look and remember what they said. And, and three, three hours of eating, two hours of drinking, and one hour drinking. of, of no, one hour I think, of. of light. Um, I, I actually think you shouldn't drink that nighttime anyway. That's what I've always been taught. But I think it's still a good, it's a good nice, quick, easy reminder, a good way to remember things. <laughs> yeah, no, I like it. It's great. Perfect. Okay, so um, it's clear to me that, you know, you're very, very passionate about what you do. You are still a researcher at heart, right? You love to get into all those details and find oh, out all the yeah. things. Yeah. But <laughs> yes. what I love about you is you bring it into a really useful, easy to understand, bite-sized kind of bits of information that you can actually apply really quickly and easily. Um, I've been very fortunate to start working with you. We're very early on our journey, but already I'm seeing the benefits. Um, like I said, there's the nose breathing, the the clearing of the sinuses, um, even just the, the fact that, I mean, I love, I love knowledge and so I've learned so much from working with you as well. Mm. So if people want to work with you, who is your ideal kind of customer and how would they get hold of you? So the ideal customer is someone who's actually ready to take some responsibility. Like I said, I'm not someone who's just going to prescribe you medication and send you on your way. I'm going to expect you to, you know, be ready to make some changes to, you know, consider changing your schedule and, mm -hmm. you know, buying in 
you know, with your behaviors and um, resources. Um, so the ideal client is accountable and just ready to make some changes. Ideal clients also are people who are, have that, you know, ability to make some changes. So if someone is like in a, you know, a sprint of stress and, you know, they're not going to be able to do things, then probably waiting until after would be more appropriate. Yep. Um, <laughs> So I think it's probably and, a similar, similar kind of person to the person I work with. You know, you've got to understand there's no magic silver bullet. There's no magic pill. It's not going to make everything go right. You've got to actually put the work in to get the results out. Absolutely. Um, and you've got to be prepared to be open to other ideas as well. So, you know, sometimes some of the things that we've been taught, um, I think back to my childhood, some of the things that my parents kind of instilled in me have been shown not to be true. So you've got to be open to kind of go, actually, I may have to change my view on this and, and um, be open and um, honest and be vulnerable a little bit as well. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's yeah. your kind of client too. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. Just ready to take charge of their health. And who are, I, have, I work with kind of the spectrum from people who already have a diagnosis and want kind of a second or third opinion to improving that all the way mm -hmm. to people who are, you know, athletes and peak performers and they kind of want to just optimize and kind of put that little icing on the, or put the icing on the cake. Yeah. Um, so that there's kind of a range and I kind of tailor my strategy, you know, I, I meet people where they are. So that's kind of I love it. Okay, so how do we get hold of you? What's the best way to get hold of you, Dr. V? So the best place is I have a website. It's www.drvanessa.life, L-I-F-E. Mm -hmm. um, you can also find me on LinkedIn um, under Dr. Vanessa Ingram, I-N-G-R-A-H-A-M. So Wonderful. probably the easiest way. Yeah, that's yeah. right. I mean, and, and for our for your for your guests, too, you can also I have a, a a business WhatsApp. You can you can send me a WhatsApp at 022-062-0018. Beautiful. Okay. Look, thank you so much for for spending the time with us. I'm loving that view behind you. Um, go and enjoy the rest of your beautiful day, and um, we look thank forward you. to catching up with you again soon. Thank you. Great. Thank thank you so much, Deb. Thanks for listening to the podcast show Better Business, Better Life. My name is Deborah Chantry Taylor. I'm an EOS implementer, family business advisor, business and leadership coach, podcaster, and speaker. However, I'm also a business owner with several current business interests. I'm fortunate to have lived the high life with all the lifestyle, the toys, you name it, and then I've lost it all, not only once, but twice in two spectacular train wrecks. I know what it's like to experience the highs and lows. I came across EOS when they launched into New Zealand using my entrepreneur's playground and event center in Parnell, Auckland. I love the simplicity of the tools and their philosophies fitted my personal brand statement perfectly. The brilliance is in the simplicity. I've always been passionate about seeing entrepreneurs lead a life they love, and now I help them live that EOS life. Doing what they love, with people they love, making a huge difference in the world, being compensated appropriately, and with time to pursue other passions. If you want more information or want to get in contact about using EOS in your business, you can visit my website at debra.coach. That's www.debra.coach. Thanks for listening.